first watched Robotech back in the spring of 1985, uh, I. I called my brother and said, this is the show we've been waiting for. I mean, there's transforming robots, there's there's drama, you know, real life drama, there's kissing and fighting and transforming robots. I mean, yeah! Like, oh, this is the cool transforming robot joke. But I, I love those missiles. I love the way those missiles are animated. Basically, it was for animation what Star Wars essentially was for live action, if I had to compare it to anything. Some people call it the grandfather of anime, that it started the wave of more of these mature titles coming to America. Robotech truly bridges ages, and it, it, it tackles themes that were never tackled before on television and animation. You know, death of characters, marriages, loves. There was nothing taboo to be covered in this series. Never gets time was, the material is still relevant. You know, we still have the love triangles. We still have war. We still have all the things that are dealt with in the movie. Robotech was created in 1985, and many of the designs are relatively timeless. They hold up even today. However, they were produced in 1985 with uh, production values of that time and we had to modernize a lot of this. But at the same time, even though we introduced new designs, we wanted to transition into them seamlessly, where people could see designs that they were familiar with from the old show and transition into the new one, so that uh, it really was a very smooth transition from the original series into this one. Even though uh, the production is remarkably cleaner, of a remarkably higher quality, uh, it still feels like an outgrowth of the original series. So let's keep doing it the old-fashioned way. <laughs> we had discovered that the animation industry in Japan had undergone a great amount of change, uh, both uh, in due to economics and also technology, where they all the process had become a digital process, and they were uh, accustomed to farming out major chunks of production overseas. I think we were looking at um, trying to figure out what was the best way to get the quality and the traditional anime feel that has always come from basically the top studios of Japan, but also from a, a price point as well as a production pipeline and a methodology that would work for all the parties involved. So when we started looking at all the different studios, we realized that a lot of the top Japanese studios were doing some of their work with some of the Korean studios. So uh, when we did our research and um, we started looking, it was DR Movie who seemed to have been doing a lot of work for Madhouse and a lot of work for Gonzo. So we started feeling comfortable that if those companies felt comfortable in subbing work out to them, then you know this was potentially a, a good place for us. Design was probably the one of the toughest processes. Uh, at the time, I was spread thin, and I had a, uh, a lot of folks come in and help me out, uh, including Long Vo, uh, one of the talented illustrators from the Robotech comic series, among others, uh, come in and create a huge design bible because Robotech was incredibly detailed. In a period of time that, in retrospect, I still think was too short, we had to send all these designs to Korea to have uh, them also clean up a little bit because they had to start 3D modeling everything. Uh, with the mecha designs, uh, there was great care taken to make sure everything fit and actually worked because now uh, we didn't have anime magic to give us a little bit leeway like we did before. Uh, these mecha elements had to be modeled in a 3D space and so they actually had to work. Although we could cheat a little bit in the transformation process, they really needed to work because uh, you know, it was almost like making things work in real life when we were in the 3D space. And with characters, obviously we wanted to capture the anime feel again, but with uh, improved production values now, we could go into much greater detail than we did before with their designs. With storyboards, we had a great deal of weight lifted off our shoulders where a lot of that work could be done in Korea. However, we oversaw this process and we also had uh, veteran uh, animation director Chris Pranowski come in and help consult on this process as well. Where I emotionally felt like we were over the hump of production where I could see the light at the end of the tunnel was when our pencil test finally came in. Because until that point, 
We knew in our minds what we were building, but that was finally when the building blocks came together and we thought, oh, we're home free. We've got something that looks killer coming in the pipeline. The entire movie from beginning to end was delivered in a rough cut form at first with uh, rough storyboard images, which evolved into pencil tests and the action sequences were originally delivered in primitive CG form. Now, this enabled us to look at it and make sweeping edits where necessary because it would have been a waste of resources to have them follow through through final animation and then have to uh, edit out the sequences. So we had the editing process actually start very early before final animation was done. And then with final animation, uh, therein begins uh, post-production and uh, calling the retakes, what works, what doesn't quite work, and uh, starting to bring in music into the process with uh, Scott Glasgow. I'm still going through the DVDs again and again and again. I finally want to see what happens to Rick Hunter.